You know what nostalgia is? For some of you, that might seem like a big word. You know what nostalgia is? It's looking back, right? The good old days. Do you remember the good old days? Did you ever have good old days? <laughs> For young people, good old days might be last year when they had a better teacher in school. For some of us that are older, we go back a little further. Some of you go way back to the good old days when life seemed kinder and gentler and nicer and more simple. You know, back around 1900, that's going back, in the United States of America, one household out of seven had a bathtub. The good old days. One household out of 13 had a telephone. How would we ever survive today with our cell phones? Wow. Only 6% of adults had a high school diploma. What do you think the average life expectancy was back then? 47. Yeah, those were the good old days. Yeah. Funny how that is. As time goes by, we think the past was better than today. That was the struggle of the Israelites. They were the people of God. And they were invited to, to love God and obey God's commandments. And God said, I will lead you to a great place, a promised land, a land that I promise you, the land of Canaan. Uh, and it will be a land flowing with milk and honey, which was an expression that meant it'll be a great land. It'll be fruitful and plentiful. And God said, all you got to do is, is obey, is listen, and follow my commands. Well, they struggled with that, as we struggle with it today. But in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, we come to the place where they're getting ready to explore this new land. And uh, Moses is probably tired. You know, he's been with these people for years and years, wandering in the wilderness, waiting to get to the promised land. They've been grumbling as they've gone through the wilderness because they didn't think they had enough to eat or drink. So in Numbers 13, the Lord says to Moses, send out some men, kind of like spies, to go into Canaan and check it out and see what it's like, and then come back and give a report. So that's what Moses does. He chooses a person from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, 12 people, sends them out as spies. And uh, later in chapter 13, we hear the report that comes back from the spies that went into this wonderful land. In verse 26, it says, They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. So it's sort of the good news, bad news. The good news is it's just like God said. It's awesome land. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. It's plentiful. They even brought back some of the fruit to show Moses. Look how awesome it is. But the people there look big and strong and nasty, and the cities are strong, and I don't think we can do this. We can't, I don't know if we can take this land. Out of the 12 that were sent, only two saw the glass as half full. They said, no, come on, we can do this. Joshua and Caleb said, no, this is the land that God wants to give us. This is our blessing. It's waiting for us. All we have to do is go and take it. But the other ten, they were really negative, really down on this mission, and they continued. Verse 31, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. They were afraid. And so, out of their fear, they were not prepared to go forward. They wanted to go backward, back to Egypt. 
Chapter 14 starts, That night all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly and said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Forget this Moses guy. Let's find a new leader and go back. Back to the good old days when we were slaves in Egypt. How is that the good old days? They were slaves for 400 years. But that's what fear can do to a person. It can make you forget what the past was really like. It can even make the past look good compared to the present. But there it was, this wonderful, beautiful, plentiful land, the blessing of God on a silver platter. And they were saying no, because they were afraid. I wonder how many times in your life and mine and as a church, we miss out on the blessing that is just around the corner because we're afraid. We're afraid to take that step. We're afraid of what might happen. And so we cower back instead of pressing forward by faith. And so the blessing is never realized. We never know what could be because we were too afraid. I believe that every person who lives as a Christian has to decide whether they'll live by fear or by faith. You have to choose. That same Joshua in the story with Caleb who said, no, we can do it, we can move forward, is the same one who said in the book of the Bible by his own name, when people are being tempted to worship other gods, he said, as for me and my house, we will worship the Lord. He made a decision and said, no, we're going to live by faith. And I heard that in Chris's words. Sometimes we want to give from our heart to help somebody or give in some other way, but we're not sure we can do that. We're not sure how it'll work out. Or we're not sure if there'll be enough left for us, enough energy, enough time, enough money. God says you can live by faith or you can live by fear. As we celebrate the ministries of this church today, I just want you to know that there are amazing things that go on here because we have people who are following by faith. There are ministries here where people's lives are touched and lives are changed as a result of a church living by faith. You know, we have a school here, the South Jersey Christian Academy, pre-K through sixth grade, at the beginning of the school year. I might have shared this with some of you. We had three children who gave their hearts to Christ. They made a decision of faith, just young children, through the school, through the ministry of the school, because the teachers led them to do that. That's what's happening around us. This is a church that not only is reaching out to the neighborhood and around the world through missionaries, but is taking care of its own. Karen Grosso shared this morning her testimony earlier at the 9 o'clock service and talked about how she felt led to give, not what she could afford, but what was in her heart, what she wanted to give, and how blessed she was to take that step of faith. Not to look at her budget, which said you can only give this much, but to give what she felt led to give and realized that she couldn't afford not to give more because she was going to miss what God had in store for her. Because by giving more, she was taking herself and God was leading her to a place of trust, a level of trust that was deeper that she never would have otherwise experienced. Some of you know, because this ministry has touched you, that we have a ministry, a meal ministry. And when folks lose a loved one or when someone has surgery... We have a team of people that will cook a home-cooked meal and take it to your home. It's an act of love. It's an act of servanthood. It's an act of Christ. That's just one of the many, many, many ministries that go on here. And not only taking care of our own, but beyond. Next week is our Thanksgiving in-gathering. I'm told there'll be over 100 baskets prepared for people in the community who would otherwise not have any kind of Thanksgiving. That's giving by faith. Not by fear, not just worrying about whether you have enough, but reaching out. And when you give, it feels good to give, doesn't it? Can you say amen? amen. 
Next month, when it gets close to Christmas time, the Hope Effort, another ministry, will provide about 100 gifts for children, again, in the community who wouldn't otherwise have much of a Christmas. We were blessed to be blessed. That's my understanding of God's walk with us in this life. God provides for us so that we can share with others. And as we do that, and as we do so by faith, amazing things happen. We realize that we can let go. And as we let go and give what we feel led to give, not just what we can afford, we find that God provides the difference. And it's a great feeling. It's, it's a promised land that we never reach if we don't take that step of faith. It's otherwise unknown to us. And I speak to you from personal experience. Four years ago, I suffered a heart attack. It was a complete shock to me and everybody that knew me. I thought I was taking care of myself and I was in good shape. It happened suddenly and it followed a period of cardiac problems. I was in the church one Sunday preaching and then the next week I was gone and never went back to the church. For two years I was out of the church. For two years uh, I was lost. I was unemployed. And you know, it's one thing to lose your job, but when you're a pastor in our denomination, you live in a parsonage, a church-owned property. When you lose your job, you lose your home. So they had to appoint another pastor to the church. And my family and I, we had to, we had to move, we had to leave. We didn't know where we were gonna go. We weren't prepared to start paying rent somewhere. That wasn't a part of our budget. We didn't know where we would go. And I was afraid. But you know what? 30 years before, my wife and I made a decision that we would always give between 10 and 12% of our income to God's work. And God always provided everything that we needed. We never went hungry. My kids have gone to college because God is faithful. He's bigger than your challenge. And so we said at that time, we're not going to stop giving. We're going to keep giving. And guess what? God took care of us. There was a church not too far so that my daughter didn't have to change schools. It was a church whose pastor had his own house, so they had a parsonage that wasn't being used. And that church let us move in. And that's where we stayed. And so I had two years out of the church to think about what it means to trust God and not just say I believe and not just preach that I believe, but to live those words. And God has taken me to a place I would have never been before, a place of trust, a place of realizing that, yes, it's not easy. And we're called to make sacrifices in life. But if we believe, there's a promised land ahead. You just have to walk by faith and not by fear. And you'll know that God can take care of you. And after two years, I got a phone call saying, would you come to Sicklerville and pastor the Sicklerville United Methodist Church? And here I am. And you have blessed me. And you have taken care of me and my family. And I am well, thanks be to God. So my doctor tells me. Still have to lay off the cookies and the cake and the ice cream and all that stuff. But God is good. God is good. Amen? Amen. I want you to know that blessing. I really, really, as your pastor, want you to know. I want you to come to that trust level and experience God in a way you haven't before. I really do. And I want you to know that times like this when we talk about stewardship and we give out estimate of giving cards, which we're going to do in just a bit, it's not about money. It's not about trying to meet a church budget. It's about an opportunity for you to grab hold of a blessing that you would otherwise miss if you're not willing to take that step. I want you to experience that. I want you to be blessed. I want you to know that God is the provider in a very real, clear way. So I'm going to pray, and then after I pray, the ushers will give out the estimate of giving cards. But here's my challenge to you. If you were here last week, you heard Bill Dealey talk about stepping up one step in your giving. I'm guessing those of you who knew that you were going to be asked to make a commitment today came today with a number in your mind. 
Maybe you already looked at your budget and said, this is what we can afford, this is the number that we're going to put down on the card. I challenge you to dismiss that number in your head and write down a different number. Not the number that you can afford, the number that you want to give to show God and yourself that you are blessed, that God has given to you first, and you want to give your best. I'd like to, I'd like to challenge you to write the number that indicates that you are going to trust on a new level like you've never trusted before so that through this next year you can see what God is going to do. I'm not saying you're going to win the lottery if you increase your offering. That's not what I'm saying. You're going to feel inside that you've trusted him in a way that you've never trusted before because you've always put maybe a little too much emphasis on the cash in the bank account, making sure you've got enough because you're not sure if he can provide. This is an opportunity to make a statement statement that says, I'm not going to live by fear. I'm going to live by faith. And I'm going to wait and see. I'm going to look for that promised land and that blessing that God has for me. Let's pray. Lord, we're talking about trust. We're talking about faith. We're talking about blessings. And we're talking about how it can all be ours. We can claim it in Jesus' name if we're willing to step out in faith. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us as a church. Grant us grace to trust you with all that we have and all that we are. Encourage us to make a commitment that reflects where our heart is with you and how much we love you. Give us the grace we need to be faithful in every way and then pour out the blessings upon us and upon this church that we might continue to celebrate your life in us and the lives that are going to be touched because we desire to make a difference. We ask all this in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, um, the ushers are going to come now and uh, pass out the estimate of giving cards. We invite you to take one if you'd like to make a commitment. If, if you're a guest here today or you've only been here once or twice, this is something that we do each year as part of our discipleship. You do not need to feel like you uh, need to fill out a card. Everyone is invited to. If you need a pen or pencil, I'm sure our ushers will be prepared to provide one for you. Once you receive the card, if you just take a minute and complete it, and then when you're ready, uh, the ushers will come back and they will collect the cards. And then I'll give you instructions about the meal that awaits you.